Alright guys, welcome back to um, episode 61 of the Bass Lessons Melbourne Player Profile Podcast and this is part 2. So if you missed part 1, probably should go and check it out. Um, either way, we are still in conversation with Harry Bruce, Roger McLaughlin and Craig Newman. So here we go, part 2. Um, Roger, I've, I've got, I did a, a, a tribute to Jemison on YouTube and, and I got an email from his son with the words, thank you for loving my dad. Oh, can you imagine? Oh, oh, that's beautiful. Can you imagine one Sunday morning when I woke up to that, I went, oh my God, this has freaked me out. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, because I, I, I do my uh, Jemison tributes on YouTube, but I know that I'm always uh, just a follower in the sense that I never get the whole thing, but what I do is get the flavour. And I think he dug the fact that I did put so much effort into it through the years. And he's checked out. He checked out. He, he, unfortunately, he died because he had a lot of medical medical problems with his back, and he died early. Yeah. So, but he, he was he, he was, that was James Jameson Junior. Right? That was his. Yeah. 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 I'm sure. And Jerry, well, Jerry Jamot even commented on one of my uh, tributes to Jamison with the words, in the head of the master. That was so cool, you know, on YouTube. Uh, you met, yeah, Jerry Jamod, who is just, you know, I, I have three kings in my life. The number one is J James Jamison. Number two is Jerry Jamod. And number three is Chuck Graney. Now, those three guys completely enveloped my whole life. So I'm talking about from the... <laughs> 1970 onwards, Chuck Graney for his bubbling, incredibly smooth work, one finger going backwards and forwards, whereas Jamison was all downstroke. So uh, different techniques. Uh, you did downstrokes? Do you mean uh, downstrokes with the forefinger? All so down. down. Yeah, all down. that. You don't want to try, man. It's really hard work. I can't do it. You mean like like flicking? Yeah, yeah. That, you yeah. get the. I'll tell you why I do it. I, my whole style is one finger. I don't use the others. I just use that one backwards and forwards. Yeah. Because as you come back up, you get an accent that you can't get forwards. Yeah. It's a kickoff, like a bass drum kickoff. Yeah. And you can't get that frontwards. Try, you try and do it front with that accent. But if you do it backwards, it hit, hits on the up. So you get those accents a lot sharper than you would with... To me, anyway, that's that's why those guys were incredible at hitting accents so so sweetly. Yeah, no, I've, I've, your your uh, James Jameson uh, videos are incredible. Mm. Harry. I've watched a few of them. It's like, man, I, I picked up my bass and tried to do it, and it's like I've got no strength going forward. It's just like. Just this floppiness, you know, I could pull up, I could damn near pull the strings off the bass that way, yeah. try to flick forward to get any grunt. Well, if you knew I wonder why, what I went through to get there, you would, I don't think you would do it, the pain. Because yeah, yeah. for years, I, I worked the backwards and forwards so much that the callus came around the other side. Yeah. Where the nail, gotcha. You know where the nail is? Yes. Well, that whole round was callus. Yeah. Once oh, that man. And once that came, I was home and hose. You were home, yeah. <laughs> ah, cool. No more pain. So I went through that threshold of years of going, taking it as far as I could. But then I got to a point where the callus was all the way around and then bang, it just, it was, it was, yeah. that's why when you follow something and you keep going, you can't get there, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Are you, are you able to grab a bass and just quickly show what you're talking if, about? If you've got a sec. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you, Craig, you should check out uh, um, Harry's uh, YouTube channel where he's dedicated to Jameson. It's a great yeah, yeah, no, I have. I have. Beautiful. Amazing. Oh, I didn't give me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did a, I've done a, I did a little Jameson video as well on my YouTube channel. I, di I did this thing, just why Harry's getting his bass, I did this thing where I, I had this same backing track, just like a kind of, one four backing track. I stole it actually from the Tower of Power Player Along book. And I did this thing where I did um the same backing track but in seven seven different bass player styles. So I did like I did Rocco, Jamerson, um, Larry Graham, Lewis Johnson, Flea, Jacko, did I say Jacko? Uh, sorry, a, a couple of other guys. 
And so it was kind of the idea of showing, like, it's, this is the same backing track, but, you know, here's how maybe these different guys would approach it. Anyway. Oh, um, he's back. He's back with his page. So you're ready to watch a bit of the uh, backwards forwards? Shows it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sounds gone. Yeah, the bloody zooms, terrible. I'm going to show you when it's full on like this. Brilliant, Harry. This is wow, the Harry. Get that time. Oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. Can't do it, man. Wow. This, that's, that's incredible. I I I've never because I've never I've never really seen footage of Jameson play. I've heard about the hook, but I didn't really I didn't I didn't know that that was what it was. It's a, this well, is, he does it a lot more. He his version of it is so much more subtle than mine. He hardly moves. Right. He has so much power in his arms that he will just slightly do this where I'm going flat out. He's just doing this to get the same effect. Because his his action is ridiculous, and he's basically an upright player that plays. Mm. He's one of the rare upright players uh, that plays with the same intensity on the electric, which most upright players don't. They get on the electric bass and they pussy out. Yeah. They, you, you, you know what I mean? They don't really uh, let loose. It's intimidating for them. Whereas Jamison was powerful on both. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, Harry, how, how did you um, figure out that technique? Did you see Steve well, Anderson that's play? Well, that's a Watto story. Right. Watto came to my house one Saturday morning with Marvin Gaye's life story in 1985. Right. A video, and there it was. There's Jamison doing it. Ah. The only video of him doing it. Yep. And I, had it, I was slowing it down. I couldn't believe it what was going on because this incredible style was coming out, but he was hardly moving, yeah. sitting on a chair. You know, the famous video of him with Marvin there yeah, playing yeah. what's going on. Yes, yeah, another one you mean. And yeah. also the sound on that is frightening because the sound guy actually mixed him right up. So that's when you, if you study that, it gives you an idea of how he got around so easily on a with with no any no sort of movement basically it was almost like zen. Mm. <laughs> he used to he used to uh, basically get drink grappa, the Italian schnapps, and and I'm telling you drink a lot of it every day. He was in the, all those Motown sessions. He was on another planet doing all those songs, mm. and. Uh, Basically, I've been told by some famous drummers that, that work with him, James Gadsden, I was sitting in with him one day and he said, he's one of the only people I, I ever met that has a photo memory. He had a photo memory. He'd look at the chart for 30 seconds. It was there in the head. Right. I've never met anyone like that. Amazing. But James ah. Gadsden basically saw it. So the, the motto of the story is... Drink lots of grappa and do it your own way. Yeah, one finger. Yeah, and also, I think what you were saying before, I do regret not getting into the theory side because I feel it was laziness on my side. But yeah. on the other hand, I went, I went full on into exploring funk and all the rhythmic rhythm that it involves. So mm. what Jamison taught me, was that he would play that song like that today, but tomorrow he would play it totally different. Yeah. So what I'm saying is his approach was different every time. Yeah. So it's a good thing to have in your head rather than be stuck with your normal 
sort of riffs and lines that you play in the song every time. Mm. Forget that. Keep the basic flavour of it, but then go off. Yeah, yeah. Keep keep the DNA. Um, it's it's really interesting you say that. Uh, I got the chance to interview Rocco um, a few years ago from my from my series, and um, at the I, I play in a band here in Melbourne called Off the Leash, which is a, a Tower of Power mm. you band. And I brought I brought my. Uh, I, that's a great band, by the way. That, is, that is a fun band. It's killer a, band, yeah. Joy. So I brought my my chart for what is hip. Not that I really need it, but I brought my what is hip chart, and I was like, after the interview, I was like, excuse me, Mr. Prestia, would you mind uh, signing this for me? And he signed it, and I told him that I was doing this band and stuff, and and he goes, well, I got one bit of advice for you, and I was like, okay, yes, sure. What is it? He goes. He goes, don't play it like how I played it because even I don't play it like how I played it. And there you go, yeah. Every live recording you see of Tower of Power is different. Garibaldi's yeah. playing different stuff, you know. Uh, the horns, obviously, are the same, but, you know, the tempos are usually different even within the same song. <laughs> and and Rocco's, Rocco changes up. You listen to What Is It from the 70s to What Is It in the 2000s and it's just like... Oh, that bit's evolved, or he's brought that bit back. It's really interesting. Yeah, he's here. I think all the greats do mix it up. Yeah, yeah. But I've got, got to mention being, too, like being in an environment where it's okay to do that, like where you were yeah. to play with Renee for so long, or, or if you, you know, Tower of Power, like it's the, that's what they do. So it's it's being it's being able to have an environment where it's safe to do that, yeah. um, you know. But but if you're just doing. You know, this gig that week and that gig next week. It, sometimes it can be tricky to do that, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's just, just keeping you're it really gonna roll up and just play the song. If you're playing in a reception band or a cover band, you, you've kind of expected to come along and just knuckle down and regurgitate the part. Yeah, yeah, it's a fine line. It, it, it depends on the players. I find that, you know, after the first couple of songs, you can get a feel for. Okay, we can we can stretch out and we can have some fun. Sure. Yeah. Whatever happens, or if it's just like, no, this is as the record, and we'll see you at the end. <laughs> well, talking about stretching out, I must mention uh, my best bass playing friend, Tim Partridge, passed away oh. about a week ago, and uh, and basically uh, probably one of the most upsetting things for me for a long time, but Tim Partridge was the only true black funk bass player that we've ever had. He was the only guy that had the handle on it because through the years I would – absorb some of uh, stuff that he was doing but he had it naturally because that sly stone thing that I'm talking the sly after w there's a riot going on not the earlier sly but that sort of funk he played it just like he was one of those guys so he used to freak me out I used to do my version of it but w well, his was real and so it was uh, and he was the guy in a lot of records he he did the gig with renee he'd follow me we were like swapping gigs left right and center i'd come in he'd go out he'd go out i'd come in because we were into that serious soul funk thing and and i guess in a way there weren't many other guys that were interested in doing that yeah and about 1980 fusion hit and i actually thought Oh well, it's been a good run. That's it for me. So I'm just a soul bass. I'm just a soul bass player. You know, I saw these fusion guys playing the stuff. I thought, forget it. There's no way I'm ever going to be able to do that. I actually thought, I know the feeling. I thought that was the twilight of my career in '98. I thought it was fading away. You know, but then fusion, unfortunately, was ditched. So I'm I'm sort of glad it was, but you know I, I'm still respectful of the stuff that went on. Unbelievable, Emeralds and Beyond, and all those things. Yes. I really enjoyed Crossfire, mate. I, even though they were fusion, I thought they were great compositions and great players. And Crossfire is uh, pretty damn funky, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I know. I mean, I've never been a. I mean, I've, I've obviously I've been in a, a fusion band, if you would call it a fusion band. I don't know what you'd call Pyramid. That's fantastic, that band. I wonder yeah. what you about Pyramid Roger. Like, I've seen seen some videos come up on YouTube. Mont I know. It's Montreux Jazz Festival, is that right? Yeah, Montreux, yeah. yeah. David Hirschfelder, eh? Well, Hirsch, look, mate, that was, a, you know, I wasn't going to get into that. But, I mean, I, to me, I'm, I'm not a jazz player. And to me, I just felt like I was a jazz imposter in that band. But I know why they wanted me in the band. I think they actually wanted someone to kind of 
lay lay it down a little bit for them, you know, and kind of give a bit of funk, a bit of rock, a bit of attitude, mm. uh, and so that those guys could, you know, so that Hirschfelder and Jones could just absolutely fly and do their thing, you know. I mean, I'm just hanging on by a thread, you know. It doesn't sound like it, Roger. It sounds like you're there right <laughs> in the guts of it. Hey, I've got to tell you, when I was working... <laughs> Thank you. When I was working with Hirschfeld, a wonderful man, he told me about the time when he was about eight, I think, and he jumped off a roof with his Superman cope, uh, cape and broke both his legs. <gasps> Jeez, I didn't know that, man. Yeah. If, if I did know it, I've forgotten. Wow. Yeah. He could fly. Superman. <laughs> Hirsch. Yeah, monster player. Um, so, so, Roger, what, what was the deal with? Pyramid, how long were you with him? I mean, the this, this stuff, like like Harry said, the stuff I saw. Well, pretty much for, for most of the band. I mean, look, a, a really quick brief history. The band started with Hirschfelder and, and David Jones getting together and jamming. And that's, so David, because David Hirschfelder lived in Ballarat, and David Jones would go up there and they'd do these little Sunday jams, and they'd just get in a room and just go. David just, uh, you know, they realised they had a real connection with odd time stuff, sevens and fives, but it was just this amazing thing. And then they got Bob Vinier involved playing flugelhorn and trumpet. Now, I think they had a couple of bass players. I know Jeremy Allsop was in the band for a while. And this is real early days. This must have been 79, I re excuse me, 79. I know Jeremy was there for a little while. And even my, the great Mike Clark. I think was possibly jamming with them. And I just happened to get the gig because I, they, Hirschfelder and Jones were working with Peter Couples at the Grain Store. Now, there's a venue, Craig. The yes, old, the, the Grain Store. Great venue. Yeah, yeah. In, uh, in King Street, um, opposite inflation. Um, so, you know, I was, I was playing in a cover band there and I remember you know, I'd go down and see the Couples band or go and jam because Mike Clark wasn't turning up for the gigs. So I'd drag, drag my bass downstairs, play a set with them, just sit and just say they had a bass player, and then run upstairs, do my set with, with, with Street Life, and then, you know, if Mike Clark hadn't turned up, I'd run downstairs and do the next set with them, you know. But I always remember David Jones would be there dancing with his girlfriend at the time, Debbie, and I'd be, yeah, I want to rock with you. We'd be doing, you know, cover stuff of, of the time. It was early 80s, you know. And David Jones would always... He'd be there dancing and looking up and grinning at me. I'm going, why is this guy looking at me grinning like that? You know, it was really weird. Anyway, I get a phone call, you know, hey, would you like to join this band Pyramid? Now, we got a gig, you know, it's the classic, Craig. We got a gig, for, it's Monday, and we got a gig Friday. I'll, I'll drop the charts off. Well, I got to tell you, they dropped the charts off. And there's the opening song, City of Stone, you know. I think, man, I can't play that. I mean, I'm in tears, you know. I cannot read it. I haven't even got the chops to play it. But somehow I just managed to, to kind of fake my way through it, you know. And uh, look, it was, a, it was a great, it was the best. Pyramid was like me going to college, like going to school, you know, going to music school, going to Berkeley almost, you know. It was like I really had to step up to the plate. There was a whole level of really getting my reading together and really understanding rhythms and, and, and sevens and fives and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, for, so for three years we just immersed ourselves in, in the music, you know. In fact, I never bought a record or even listened to the radio. It was just pyramid in sessions for three years, you know. Wow. Just constantly, you know. In any spare moment I'd be around at David Jones' place jamming, you know. A lot of rehearsals, a lot of jamming, you know. And, man, I've got all the cassettes from all those jams and all those gigs. I've got boxes and boxes of C90s. David Jones would record everything on his Walkman, you know. It's pretty amazing. Uh, it's, of course, and obviously, you know, it, it all kind of peaked with us going to, to the Montreux Jazz Festival, you know, and being... Who, who, else, who else was there that year? Can you remember? Oh... Oh, oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. Yeah. Um, oh, now my mind's gone blank. There were some really cool people there. I was going to say, it was no, Billy Cobb wasn't there. Um, Simon Phillips was there. I think Herbie Hancock was there that year. I really think he was there. Um, 
Max Roach, the drummer, was there, I seem to recall. A lot of college bands, a lot of jazz college bands, which are interesting, you know. I'd have to go back and actually search 83 as to who was actually there. Yeah. But uh, it was weird, man. Our first gig, they put us on late on a Sunday night, the last band. We didn't get on till after midnight. There was 300 people left in the room. And and we must have played till about 1.30 in the morning, you know, to a very enthusiastic, you know, two or 300 people. And um, Claude Nobbs, the director, was absolutely blown away. And uh, What a name. Well, I know, Cla I know Claude Nobbs. <laughs> he was the Molly Maldrum of the Montreux Jazz Festival in every sense of the word. Um, and I'll leave that to your imagination. Um, and, and, and so we did the Sunday night, and Monday night there's a real – like Monday morning there's an absolute kerfuffle. It's like, man, who is this band that played at Montreux on, on – uh, on Sunday night, you know, people were wanting to interview us and all that stuff. And Claude Nobbs actually put us back on uh, on the Monday, first band on Monday at 8 o'clock, and he's never done that. In fact, I've actually got a videotape of him saying that in the history of the of the, of the the Montreux Jazz Festival. I've never bumped everyone back an hour to bring this band on. He said, I just wanted ev a full house. I wanted everyone in Montreux to hear this band, you know, so... We, we got another look in. We gave us 45 minutes set on, on the Monday at 8 o'clock and it was beamed all across um, uh, Europe, you know, via radio out of the studio. So, yeah, they were very special times, man. Um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely incredible. And, of course, the amazing part about the here's the sting in the tar. We'd finished that tour and we'd done it, played a few other places in Europe. And before we went back to Europe, uh, David Hirschfeld, the grab, just... Or gathered us all in the room to inform us that he was leaving the band and joining Little River Band. Oh. <laughs> so it was like just like a, a, it was just like a knife through my heart, you know. B given my history with the band, and I'm in this band that's ready to take on the world, you know. In my mind, we were like the new weather report from Australia, you know. Yeah. Oh, sorry, guys, I'm leaving the band. I'm joining Little River Band. But so, so like, going, going from, you know, the initial moment of, like, can you do the gig, here's the charts, uh, and you kind of, like, freaking out. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, you were all in. Well, yeah, pretty much. You know, I mean, David Jones just took me under his wing. I mean, he was amazing. He'd say, look, man, he said, you can play. He said, don't worry about reading it. He said, you can play it. Just feel it. You know, you've got the feel for it. Don't worry about what, if it's a bar of 7.8 or a bar of, you know, or a bar of 7.8.5, 8.7.8.7.8.3.4. Seven, you know, you just kind of, rem I would remember the rhythms. da 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 yeah, all that kind of stuff. You just got to hear it in, in long. Yeah, time. I would just kind of hear it and play it. And he said, "Mate, you're doing great. You, you know, you're fantastic." But he would he would take me under his wing and and, and we'd slow groove sevens and fives down. You know, ba do ba do do da do one do three one do one do three. Kind of okay, you can do that now. Let's do it in four. You know, da and da da do ba and da and ba and ba to ba ba. Keeping the four going, you know. So, you know, every day with David Jones was like going to, to having a master class, you know. Oh, I, mean, I mean, like, how old was David Jones back then? Oh, they were in the early 20s, man. Yeah, I mean, to, and to have such a such a grasp on that kind of stuff oh, age. Unbelievable. I mean, you know, I, I look back at those Montreux things and I look at, at Hirschfelder and Jones and, like, I mean, both of them. I don't know whether you've heard of a guy called Jacob Collier. Any one of you guys checked out <laughs> Jacob Collier? Yeah. Yep. Amazing musician. I watch him play piano and he's just, I mean, he can play anything, but I watch him play piano at that young age of early 20s. And I go, that's what David Hirschfeld was like. You know, he had incredible chops and technique and, you know, and no fear. That's the other thing. You were talking about no fear, Harry, and not having any fear and, and going with the moment. And that's what Pyramid taught me was to get on stage and believe in yourself, you know, and trust yourself that you're going to be okay. Yeah, you might make a mistake, but, you know, the thing was to hold your nerve and get out of that and don't shipwreck, you know, and, and 
you know, the live jams that we used to do, and they weren't just one chord grooves. They were like really out there stuff. And, you know, David and both Davids were really pushing the boundary. Trust, trust yourself and trust your bandmates. Absolutely, yeah. And so I, I revel in, in playing in bands these days when I feel a shipwreck coming on i go ah right the to me it's like freedom it's like and you'll dig this harry it's like someone's made a mistake and you don't want to shipwreck so you go with the flow and, and improvise a jam you know you will don't stop and freak out just keep going because you will and listen and and, and, and work through it you know and as a bass player you find a point where okay bang, there's the one, we're back into the verse or into the bridge or whatever, you know. So that's what I, that was one of the valuable things that I learned from Pyramid, you know, mm. from David, both of them, really. That's great. It's interesting that you brought up um, Herbie Hancock, because that was when, Harry, when you were talking about, you know, the advent of fusion and kind of, you know, the death of funk, uh, disco, whatever. Like, I kind of feel like Herbie Hancock kind of, melds all that together he's probably maybe the common denominator that would bring the jazz guys with the funk guys and even oh yeah rock guys together like craig did you do you get into the kind of herbie stuff that kind of funk fusion yeah absolutely absolutely yeah did you ever do any <laughs> any projects kind of in that idiom uh no not at the moment but uh, uh, yeah i have played a lot of that stuff and <laughs> yeah. uh, I've always um, had instrumental projects on the side as well, like f uh, funk bands, fusion bands. Yeah, um, you have. Had a, had a great 10-piece uh, funk band that used to do the Everyone every Tuesday night. What was that called? Uh, Funky Film Express was... Um, yeah, uh, I remember that, Pat. That was great. Um, yeah. Jeff Wells on guitar, beautiful... You know, Jeff World, one of my favourite guitar players. Yeah, one of my, one favorite. my favourite guitar players too, man. He's a monster. You know, he's like man, the Hiram Brook of he's Australia. Our Jeff Beck. He's our Jeff Beck. Yes, yeah, he well. is. He's our Jeff Beck. Yeah, well, yes, as well. Yes, wow. absolutely. Yeah. Um, have you ever checked, Craig, have you ever checked out a band called The Truth? Yeah, Tony Cope. Cool. Yeah, the truth. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, look, there's a couple of videos floating around of them playing live. One of my favourite bands without a bass player. Exactly. Yeah, Michael, Michael Carano basically oh. plays bass. Yeah. I, I did a double a gig with him at the Mansell Room. He came in and played bass and I played bass. And he is so heavy and tough. And oh, yeah. Heavy. Yeah. And he's like, he is massive on the bass. Yep. Massive. Yeah, he's, he really does. He really plays keyboard bass like a bass player. He thinks he plays like a bass player. Yeah, yeah. Oh, incredible groove. Yeah. Um, yeah. Phil Phil Reinhardt in the comments wants to hear Craig's thoughts on playing with Larry Carlton. I'm guessing that's you, Craig, not me, because <sighs> Larry. Well, that was yeah. That was that was a, a, a highlight that um, came up out of nowhere. Really, that was in. Um, uh, it was probably probably only three or four years ago. Um, right. Hey. And that one. <laughs> hey. Yeah. It's a J. Hey, by the way, this is JJ. Of course. JJ. Hey, J. Oh, look, all right. I'm going to have to get my cats. Are we going to do cat? This is uh, Bella. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's a beauty. Looks like you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Check him out. Uh, That's a very chilled out dog, Craig. Oh, uh, he's, um, well, you know, we're, we're struggling with our dogs at the moment, Rog. They're um, getting old. 14 and 11 and uh, uh, blind, deaf, having trouble walking. So she, she just sits with me all day in the oh, studio. Sure. It's great. Um, Craig, tell the story about Larry Carlton. I'm going to, I'm not being rude. Okay. I've had, a, I've had incredible raves with Jerry Pantazis about. Yeah, well, uh, now, Tuck, uh, uh, Larry, so I just excuse me for a minute. I'm just going to get a refill. <laughs> Carry on. We um, we got asked to do that gig about a month before um, uh, Larry was coming out here, and um, you know uh, he sent out the repertoire, which the repertoire changed 
right up until the second well, gig. Where, where, where was the gig? What was the what was it? Uh, it was a tour of Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, cool. And so, so he, he just came out by himself and and got a local band. Local he came band. out with his guitar tech, who also did fall back front of house. It was was like Larry's manager as well. Wow. You know, and was he, this is a silly question, but was he good? Not Larry, but his tech front of house. I mean, that's, oh, yeah. that's brilliant. a lot of hats. No, no, he was brilliant. They're, they're a well-oiled machine. Um, so, you know, uh, all this music rocked up in my uh, Dropbox and charts, you know, or scribbled charts, whatever. Yeah, like how, uh, how, how, um, how pro are Larry Carlton's charts? Uh, well, to be honest, I didn't use them. I, I, I sort of made a decision that, okay, you know, uh, I can read down this stuff and just go over it, but I've got a month here. Um, there's no reason why I can't learn all these tunes properly. I don't need, you know. If I've got time to learn tunes without charts, I will always do that. So what was it, like, like 20, yeah. 20 tunes or something? Uh, there was, yeah, like... Yeah, maybe 15 tunes. Okay. Which, as I said, you know, a couple of them he, he changed after the first gig because he was getting requests for tunes that weren't in the set. Right. So, you know. Um, but that was great. I mean, uh, Larry rocked up on the Sunday. We, we were booked in to do a rehearsal on uh, Monday down at uh, South Melbourne. Um, who, who else was in the band, sorry? Uh, Phil Tertio, great mm -hmm. keyboard player, and Jerry, just the three of us, and Larry. Wow, that's awesome. And um, you know, so we did uh, we 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 did the rehearsal, and he just sort of randomly picked out a couple of tunes. We played them. Oh, uh, there's a kitty. There's we, a pussy cat. We played those tunes. He was happy. Um, so he cut the rehearsal short, and then uh, we went off and started doing the gigs. Wow, you, d you didn't you didn't run the whole. We didn't run the whole set. I can't even remember running the whole set at all. He was just, uh, you know, he could see that we'd all done the homework. He was happy. happy. And uh, what an incredible exper <laughs> experience! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Craig. <laughs> Go for Where it. have I started? <laughs> well, no. They do not. Our cats do not like being picked up. Uh, so, <laughs> so what? What did you? So for like Larry Carlton, I mean, talk about Mr. Music. I mean, like every, like it was just so smooth as a lot of those LA players are. They're, they're just so slick. And you know, one of the biggest things on that gig was dynamics. He would bring the whole show down to like just you could hear a pin drop. So you could actually just slightly pluck a string and it would just, you know, it was beautiful. Those, okay. kind of, those dynamics I miss in a lot of situations, but he really uh, made sure that, you know, that was all happening. And, and we could all hear that, you know, he'd, he'd bring it down, we'd just come down. With it, so. You're right. It's funny yeah. you say that. I, that's been my experience of, of uh, watching a lot of American musicians I think they generally play in that style of music. I, I remember doing a support for uh, Roberta Flack and her, and her band played so quiet on stage. I was flabbergasted. I think Aussies tend to kind of dig in a bit and go for it, whereas the Americans t tend to play a lot quieter, which gives them a much a bigger dynamic range. Mm. Yeah, um, well, you know, Steve Gadd. Yeah, he doesn't. You know what a what a groove that guy's got. But he's not. He's not touching. Oh, yeah, it's a light touch. And, and when he chooses to, he can just hit a time, and he's got there's you know so much space to go somewhere. Well, he's got somewhere to go. It's that old story, isn't it? You have actually somewhere to go dynamically. You know. Yeah. I'm I'm, I'm learning to do that myself. Play with a bit more dynamic control. You know. Bring the band down. It gives you somewhere to go. You know? Do you do you find that part part of that is to do with um, new technology? You know, innovations in amplifiers and and bass. No, not at it all. Makes, I just it makes it easier to hear yourself, or is it just the kind of 
um, you know, the energy of youth versus the wisdom of age? Well, it's a little bit that, but I actually think that uh, that there, that uh, Australian musicians and maybe Kiwi musicians do tend to hit a little harder. They dig in a bit more as bass players. You know, I mean, you, Harry, you dig in. Tim Partridge digs in. I mean, I, I dig in ridiculously, and I'm learning to actually not dig in as much. You know. <laughs> You can actually play a lot faster lines and play be more fluid if you actually pull back a little bit and don't dig in so hard. You know, that's a that's a that's I've always had that problem, Rog, because you know when I play with in the rock situation with a lot of those guys, you're kind of expected to, you know, dig in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really my sound. I dig in. It's what I do, you know. And I, I, I do that anyhow. And I, I, it's always when I'm when I go back to playing other styles of music, I actually have to be conscious of okay, I I can't play like I need to back off and and yeah yeah and that, and that, and that doesn't mean in uh, changing the intensity of the groove. You're right. I, and that, just, uh, yeah, you have to do that to you know you have to adapt sort of thing. Absolutely, I think that's that is it in a nutshell. Is you can actually back off. Uh, I think I learned that with Pyramid a bit too. Is actually you can actually back off, but still play with incredible intensity, like still really intense. But you're not bashing your fingers to bits. I mean, you can't you can't play a fretless bass flat out. It doesn't. You choke it. It just. Well, yeah, you're right. Yeah, if you stroke it, it just balloons. It balloons yeah. out. Yeah, you know. Yeah, interesting. So I cut you off, but you were talking about the dynamic thing, you know, with uh... and um, <clears throat> yeah, and um, oh yeah, Larry was just it was surreal, just hanging out with him for a couple of weeks. Yeah, did you get did you get to have some? Uh, and we did, you know. I found myself walking down the streets of Wellington, you know, with Larry, and we're looking for somewhere to have a coffee and chat, eat, plastic. Um, As you, do. But, uh, you know. Uh, there was a situation in, uh, there was a, one of the gigs we did in Brisbane, I think it was Brisbane or Canberra, where his amp was just started to crap out on stage halfway through the set. And I th I'm thinking to myself, well, man, he's going to lose his shit here. And um, he just turned it into like there was nothing going on, you know. Uh, and there was, we didn't have a guitar tech. Our tech was doing a front of house. So <laughs> there was no one there to sort out what the problem was with Larry's amp or whether it was the pedals or whatever, but he, he just played through it, we played through it. No, nothing rattled him at all. He was just amazing. Yeah. That's a true pro, isn't it? Yeah, he was amazing. Yeah. yeah. He was one shot, wasn't he? Attacked. Well, he was shot in the neck. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, by an intruder and uh, had to re basically re relearn how to play. Amazing. Should, should, yeah. should have just went to bass. That would have been the easy option. Yeah, well, he, you know, his son's a great bass player. I mean, true. he's killer. I, I checked out a lot of uh, his playing when I got this gig. Obviously, you know, Learn, learning the live version. When you get a gig, you know, you go online, you check out. You know, um, like last year, I was doing some gigs with Russell Morris. So I thought oh, I'm going to Google Harry because I know Harry's done a lot of stuff with Russell. Just check out how he plays it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Mitch Cairns, who, who's been... Mitch, yeah, I know uh, Mitch very well. Great, beautiful. Um, okay. that, that's, uh, well, what, one of the little points I had written down here to talk about would be um, some of the major shifts in the the music industry, you know, over the span of your career. And just when you brought that up there, Craig, about the fact that when you get a gig, you can actually just go on to YouTube and find pretty much the entire musical back catalogue of human history. Yeah, I'm not sure. Is that a good thing or not? I don't know. It just oh, it can confuse you. Uh, it can but, confuse you, but, you know, if it's if it's five days to the gig and you've got to learn it, it, it can, you know... It's, uh, it's certainly good to, like, you know, if you've got a, a beautiful, great bass player that's done that gig, then I, I want to see, you know... Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it... Brought it, to the picture. It, um... It limits the excuses you can have for not learning the shit. So anyhow, um, I, I, yeah, I was getting back to Russell Morris. I was Googling some stuff, and this live gig came up somewhere with Harry playing bass in, into this incredible slap solo just out of the blue. It was amazing. 
Uh, Russell, I love Russell. He's he's uh, I and first Kevin. toured with I first toured with him in 1972. So yes. we go back a long way, and and he's a gem. Yeah, he's yeah. always always whinging, but he's a gem. You know, <laughs> he's great. <laughs> Harry, tell us a little bit about the, the Billy Thorpe gig. Um, Billy was an incredible play with because he actually, for a big star, treated his musos really well with a lot of respect and and appreciated having them there. And uh, I, I, I was, it, it was such a sad thing that he died because uh, yeah. he was told about his problem when he had a, a, a turn on Jack Thompson's farm. I've heard this, uh, yeah. Yeah, and he was supposed to go and get it checked out and all he needed was a stent. That How many yeah. people have had a stent? That's all he needed. Yeah. And, and and the hidden thing was that he was so engrossed in his album, Tangiers, took years. I remember, I remember going in there, he'd spent two weeks on one drum track with Beat Detective. I mean... And staying up all night. And the thing is, he was smoking cigarettes a lot in and out, of, like in the studio. I think he looked so great, but in the end, I think it was just just the the cigarettes and the heart condition because he would have been, he'd still be around, I think, if he had just got, got it sorted out. He just didn't do it. Um, I was super lucky to... Um, get to interview Lee Sklar when he was out here a couple of years ago with maybe last year, a year and a half ago with yeah. Phil Collins, and um, and he talked about his time with Billy Thorpe. Yes, and Gil Matthews. Mm. Yeah, yeah. and his, his crazy rig that he had. <laughs> yeah, have you seen pictures of that rig? It's unbelievable. It's yeah, I agree. Yeah. One of the world's greatest bass players, Lee. He is, he is as smooth as you get. He is. Man, I love watching his video channel. And I realise, I've actually made a comment in one of his songs. I just, you know, watching his video channel, I just realised that, that, you know, he's been a, a subtle influence on my bass playing for the last 30, 40 years. Yeah, right. As much as, oh, yeah. As, and, and you don't realise until you realise the body of work that he's played. Absolutely. It's for me. It started with um, you know Russ Kunkel and um, James Lisa Taylor. Clark, James Taylor, man. I mean, yeah, James Taylor, exactly. Yeah, for me. But when you find out about the other stuff that he's played on film, oh, know, TV that. stuff, and, and, and you know, and it's, you realise that Lee has been subtly influencing me, you know, over the last 30, 40 years. It's like whether it's groove choice of when to not when to maybe go up the neck play a little flourish a little line back down to the groove yeah and and such a beautiful cat too is lee he's not he's not scared of getting involved in the political scene because he's always being yeah. he's always in the jail in facebook jail from <laughs> letting trump have it yeah. yeah but but you know but he's still nice about it he's not too aggro but he's just he's very passionate about yeah, beliefs, and of course he's bloody well right. <laughs> I I saw um, Lee play at uh, the Paris Cat Jazz oh, Club. No, wow! Did, did anyone? Did you see that, Craig? I didn't get there. No, no. no he was just playing with a trio, a beautiful piano player that he. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Craig, who, is, who is married to uh, uh, Harry Sheen? Uh, yes. <laughs> well, you know, I filmed that concert. It's on YouTube. Oh, okay. Go and check it out. And close up, it's it's Lee close up. I did a great job of filming yeah. it. The whole oh, wow. two sets, the whole two sets is all on YouTube. Just, yeah. just put, put my name in and Lee's name and you won't believe how good it is. That's where, when you see Lee that close up being that subtle. Oh, oh I did. I, I, you know, I was sitting second row from the front at this jazz club. Um, <laughs> well, at, at the Paris Cat, second row from the, from the front is practically the bar. But just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but just getting back to Lee, I mean, uh, that thing of, you know, uh, all he has to do is, you know, there are so many different ways you can attack a note. Mm. Do you just play it? Do you slide up to it? Do you, yeah. 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 Do you slide down to it? Is, do you want to make it short? Do you want to make it long? It's just a classic example of um, a, a player with a, a lot of experience. Yeah. And he, he never knows what looked, to play and when to play. He flustered, you know. He always just... Even no. in some of the, the heavy Toto stuff. Yeah. Just, you know. 
Please and how me. dumb am I? I only found out about a, the last year or so that that Lee played on on uh, Billy Cobham's Stratus. Stratus. I never realised that was the great Lee Sklar on that. That really blew me away when I found that out. Yeah. When he, when he reproduced that bass line on, on his uh, stream, I couldn't believe it. Ten minutes on that line. Yeah. <laughs> so smooth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, as a bass player, I think one of the hardest things to learn is to loop, to reproduce a line exactly the same, like bar after bar. Yeah. Most monotonous career. Yeah, most bass I players. Say monotonous, but I know what you mean. That's a serious discipline because it's most not, bass players absolutely Harry. move off. They move off but, it. But, but I don't find that a discipline. I mean, if you don't want to play bass, then <laughs> yeah, if you don't want to do that, you shouldn't if be. If you don't want to bass. do that, you should do something else. Exactly. I mean, you, you need to, you need to find joy in that. I think. Oh, absolutely, and I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um. Well, I should tell you my story about playing with Billy Cobham, but I won't. <laughs> well, you can't. No, you can't do that. This is when you need to <laughs> play with Billy Cobham. Mate, I got a. I don't know when this was. This must have been eighties uh, or nineties or something. Is it? Is it before me or after me? Let's put it in that window. What? Well, have you played with them as well? No, no. Before I was born. So oh, uh, or after I was born in the eighties. No, you you you'd be a young tacker, I reckon. Look, I I can't remember. Possibly the nineties, I think. Was that with um? Was that at the Corner Hotel, Roger? Yeah, we did two gigs. We did the Corner yeah. Hotel and oh. uh, God, I had the and the other one, the Corner and something else. I was there. Wow. <laughs> Look, to cut it long story short, I get a phone call one day, and it's this guy. He's the, he's a promoter from Perth of this particular drum. Uh, I forget the drums that Billy was playing. He said, "Look, I'm bringing out this guy called Billy Cobham. Can you put a band together for Melbourne?" I've gone, "What?" He said, "Yeah, <laughs> Billy Cobham. Can you put a band together?" I said, "Well, yeah, probably." So anyway, I did. I I chose um, basically. I chose. Um, uh, loose change, you know. I had uh, Joe Kendama on keys, Mark Domney on guitar, and Tony Hicks on sax. And uh, he arrived. I set up a rehearsal at AAV Studio Two. For those that know, um, the old Armstrong Studio was still there. Um, and he'd sent back talking about charts. He'd sent these charts, and they were computer generated charts. You know, so there were no th such things as signs and coders. You know. I remember there was one chart, uh, reams of paper that Joe and Dama had stuck together. It was 14 pages, you know. And, you know, playing songs in the key of F, but it was written in the key of E sharp. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the, I have to say that playing with Billy Cobham was abs an absolute joy. What a beautiful man Billy is, man. He came in. And he said, let's just play it, you know, because we're all shitting ourselves. If we got to think we're going to launch straight into Stratus or something, you know, some heavy fusion stuff. And uh, he was very gentle with us, you know. He just, hey, let's just play a little standard. Just a little swing standard that we all knew. We all just playing going, you know, so. Testing the waters kind of Yeah, he was testing, just kind of getting everyone relaxed and, you know, doing stuff, checking it out. Hey, let's maybe try this song, you know. And so we rehearsed, pretty much rehearsed stuff. And, and, and you know, it's like, okay, this is going to be okay. And, and I can't remember where the first gig was. Mm. And we get to the first gig and all hell breaks loose. Like, you know, we jump on stage and, and you know, as soon as, as uh, Billy hits the stage, it's like, bang, it's showtime. And so all the rehearsals that have been kind of at this level, all of a sudden it was like, bang, they're up there. And, you know, by the end of the night, we're flying. And that was the first gig, you know. And like the second gig, it was like even more intense. So he just, once I think he felt uh, trust and, and comfortable with the musicians, uh, he would just absolutely go for it, you know. So, so, so it, it was a success. It, it was a success. It was a wonderful thrill, and I know that somewhere out there, somebody took a video of one of the, of one of the gigs, and I've seen snippets on it, and I don't know where that where that is or whether it still exists. But uh, 
Yeah, man, it was, he was a really cool dude, and you know, we'd go and have uh, have, have a meal afterwards, and he loved his cigars, you know. But he'd be the sort of guy that'd be up at six o'clock in the morning in the gym working out, a bit like yeah. Virgil Donati, you know, really dedicated to the cause. And uh, yeah, lovely man, man, just no ego. It's really cool. I got to play with him very briefly uh, in Canada at a jazz, uh, a drum festival in, in Nova Scotia, of all places. In New Scotland. Yeah, yeah, and up there in Canada. Uh, that would have been late, was it 2000, 2008 or 2009 or something? A friend of mine was running a drum festival up there. And it was incredible because it was, he called it the year of the legends and like every drama you could possibly think of was there, like Billy Cobham, Bernard Purdy. Oh. <laughs> I got to share a dressing room for those entire weekend with Bernard Purdy, man. That was cool, hanging out with Bernard. I <laughs> know. Oh, and, you know, Danny Serafin, um, oh, drummer from Chicago, um, what's his name? Is it not Al? Is it Alan White, the drummer from Yes that played on Alan White? Alan White yeah, yeah, Alan White. Yeah, uh, God, I've got a book with all their names. Look, I don't want to drop names, but that that was pretty cool to play with all these legendary drummers. And the cool thing about the gig was that at the, after the days of at, at three days of crazy drum stuff, you know, um, my mate who was running it had organised for every drummer to come out and play uh, one of their hit songs that, that they'd, been, they'd played on, you know. Um, and, and we'd read, we, so, okay, so we did, uh, uh, <clears throat> oh, what was the drummer that used to play with the wings? God, my mind's blank now, but all Kim these... Gordon. Uh, Kim Gordon. Harry's Kim, Kim Gordon. No, no, before that. You know, back in early days of Wings, and he played on My Love and songs like that. Uh, look, the reality is that all these incredible drummers, you know, people like Bernard Purdy, uh, the drummer from Santana, the original drummer. Michael. Uh, yes, Michael. Michael Shreve. Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so how the, how the festival finished was every drummer came out and played the house kit, and we'd rehearse with another drummer. We'd rehearsed up all these songs, so each drummer would come out at the end and play one of their hits that they were really. Uh, Liberty DeVito was there. Uh, did a song with Liberty DeVito, and uh, and of course well, Bernard Purdy came out, and we did Babylon System, man, with Bernard Purdy. Yeah, good that beautiful that. Purdy shuffle. Yeah, so that was a re that was I just thinking that was a real highlight to play with all these incredible drummers, you know. And Andrew Fry just said Danny Sewell. Danny Sewell, yeah. Who's that? That's the drummer from Wings, yeah. That's the drummer from Wings, yeah, yeah. Danny Sewell, yeah, yeah. Um, Danny Sewell and Dad, and uh, yeah, I've, got, I've, got, I've actually got a little thing with all the drummers. Okay. And Billy Common was there, yeah, we did, um, we did Stratus, you know. But to play Babylon Sister with uh, Bernard Pretty, that was pretty cool. The Purdy Shuffle. That was Purdy Shuffle. That was that was life changing when I discovered the Purdy Shuffle and watched videos about it and listened to things. And then you know, then the Rosanna, then the Jeff. Yeah, yeah. As well, you know, the evolution of the Purdy Shuffle um, in that kind of studio I'll, world. I'll tell you the funny thing about that gig. You know, we're because we, we hadn't actually rehearsed. We'd kind of rehearsed with another drummer, but. Uh, so we'd never actually rehearsed these songs we're about to play. We might have talk through them in the dressing room with each drummer, you know. Oh, and uh, Carmen of Peace was there. You know, do if you think, uh, Rod Stewart, if you think I'm sexy, that was pretty what crazy. A band. I, did, uh, I did a couple of gigs with Carmine, that was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, with Steve Housden, uh, it was, uh, with Carmine, you just jumped on board this incredible train. Freight train, oh, absolutely, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. It, it was amazing, and after, he was an amazing guy in the sense after each gig, it, he was like uh, the mafia family. You had to come and have the big meal and sit around and talk. And <laughs> he, 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 he was basically, once you're in that van, you had to come and do the whole family thing. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> right. But it was exciting. Right. 
come on. They just would keep me hanging on, freak me out. Mm. Yeah, and I didn't realise he'd co-written If You Think I'm Sexy with Rod Stewart. That's his pension right there. Yeah, and like he, we actually did it. He actually re-recorded it with with guitars and a really heavy version of it, rather than a disco version, you know. Uh, but I, 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 Denny Sewell. Ah, oh, there it is. Thank you. I wonder what that was that came up on my iPad. Thank you. Um, I've got to tell you though, uh, just briefly, Bernard Purdy comes out and. Uh, I said, right, we're doing Babylon. So I said, yeah, okay, man. I said, uh, he said, count me in. I said, no, no, man, you do the drum. <laughs> count me in. And you know what? I wished I had it because I said, no, man, it starts with the drums. You start it. So they say, go, shaka, go, boop, go, you know, and it, but he, so he played the fill, but he, he was nowhere near the tempo. He played the thing really fast, and I'm expected to be right back in the pocket, you know. So I wished I had have counted him in. So he started real, really up tempo wise. Dabalon sister, really way quick, you know. But in true bass player fashion, I leaned on him big time, <laughs> pulled him back. Well, I, I saw Bernard at uh, the Hard Rock Cafe in New York and I borrowed Renee's recording Walkman and I thought, I'd be really clever. I'm going to stick this right under his hi-hat. <laughs> so I, right? I, I, while he was off having a drink, I, I put my coat down, but underneath the coat on the, on the hi-hat was the Walkman. <laughs> so basically I recorded that gig and as he walked off, guess what he did? He stepped right on it. <laughs> oh, no! And so when I left New York, I didn't have the heart to tell Renee that her Walkman had a cave in of the microphones from Bernard Purdy's foot. So I just, I just put it in a drawer and left out. <laughs> but was the, was the recording okay? Oh, I've got to tell you this fantastic grain store story. The old grain store, right? We're doing I'll, you. I'll, I'll be back in one, one second, guys. All right. Please continue. Please continue. Don't worry. Now, uh, Basically, uh, at the grain store, we were doing New Year's Eve. Are you still there? Yeah, well, I'm here, man. We're listening. Okay, I'm here. With, well, Renee's doing a New Year's Eve gig. She's finished it, killed it, and she's getting dressed on, and basically, you know, how sweaty she gets. And the, the manager of grain store came in and started wanting to socialise while she's getting dressed, and she just let him have it. So... And so, you know what he did? He grabbed her by the hair and dragged her out into the street, right, Renee? And Wano came out and tried to intervene and got, like, cop one from a bouncer. So you can imagine what sort of night this New Year's Eve thing was. Is this the grain store in Melbourne? Yeah. Can you imagine Renee really? being dragged out into the street New Year's Eve oh, by man. the hair? Well, by the manager? Yeah. I know that guy. I'm not going to yeah, say yeah. his name. Yeah, I know who you mean. Wow. Quite a shock. The star. I'm, mm. I'm surprised Renee didn't deck him before it got that far. Uh, I think she got back somehow. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it was nice of Wado in, to intervene. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy days. Yeah. But with Renee, it was always very unpredictable. Can you imagine if I wrote a book about my experience through the years with Renee? It, was, it would be amazing, but uh, it was always yeah, a lot of fun. You past a lawyer first, man. Yeah, it was always a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 Always. Yeah. Well, what have we... Well, I, so what happens now? Well, we could just take <laughs> over. <laughs> Okay, where's the jokes there then, uh, Roger? Okay, so oh, okay, it's corny joke time. All right, here we go. I've got some dad jokes. <laughs> How do you make a fruit punch? You give it boxing lessons. Wow. Hey, Roger. Yes. Say knock, knock. Knock, knock. Who's there? Who's there? <laughs> 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 oh, you cook, line, and sinker. <laughs> oh, that's an old one, Harry. You got me. 
Gotcha. You did, yeah. I don't think I can top that. Hey, uh, say, say Peggy Babcock three times fast. No. Pe Peggy Babcock, Peggy Babcock, Peggy Babcock. Go and try it. Peggy, Peggy. Pe <laughs> Are you Peggy Babcock, Peggy Babcock, Peggy Babcock. Stop it! Look, how does a penguin build its house? No idea. It glues it together. I've heard that somewhere. Yeah. All right, that's enough of that. Hey, I've got to tell you, you know, back in, oh, 19, back in 1965, when uh, we did an audition for the biggest record company in Australia, Festival Records, my band, The Amazons, yep. we went in there, played a really average version of Stand By Me, and the A&R guy runs up to us, uh, to us and says, you guys are great, you're signed. All we did was play a bad version of Stand By Me. <laughs> 1965, so wow. this is the biggest record company in Australia with Johnny O'Keefe. Ah. And imagine what, how easy it was to get a record because we, we were probably going to be the next Herman's Hermits, you see. Wow. But, now, did he know it was a cover or did he just think you guys were just... He knew it was a cover. We were all doing covers. No one was writing. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Like Ray Brown's yeah. whole... Yeah. Ray Brown and even Billy Thorpe's whole set was all covers of, yeah yeah mashed potato was james brown or whatever yes yeah. wow and and you know you basically uh, billy thorpe's stage moves he told me were all copied from james brown yeah i can dig that the early days yeah, mm. yeah. all right there we go um two hours later end of part two what a chat it was with these guys. Um, so many amazing stories and a massive respect for, for everybody um, between them, which is, which is really cool. So, guys, thanks for listening. Um, stay tuned for part three.